What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out Wasted Potential, NXT's biggest failed call-ups. We've had this discussion plenty of times on how wrestlers were well received in NXT and then when they went to the main roster, they received several changes and it seems like the momentum they had there didn't transfer to the main roster. Now, some people can say, well, maybe they didn't have the charisma. Maybe the, the casual fan couldn't really relate to them. And then some could also say that Vince McMahon really didn't too much have high hopes for some of these individuals anyway. So he kind of didn't really give them that same type of intensity and, and care for their character as much as it was in NXT since NXT at the time was ran by triple h so we're gonna check out some of these moments and you know have our discussion whether we agree or disagree with some of the nxt call-ups and how they were handled do we think they were handled properly do we think they were mishandled and we're gonna go into that appreciate all the love and support you guys to show on the channel uh let's get right into this one man. comes to their future direction in the company and the reason for this is because prior to Triple H taking over as the head of creative, there was a definite sense that no matter how good of a run someone had down on NXT, there was a pretty good chance the boss was going to screw them up once they moved on to Raw or SmackDown. Pretty much. Yes, it's been one of the biggest critiques of WWE over the last few years, but which wrestlers experienced the most egregious examples of this? Well, the Karrion Cross one, yeah, what they did to his costume is like a ring attire how he lost on his debut night on raw to i uh, believe jeff hardy in the way the fashion that he lost in now granted even though he's back doesn't he's he, i guess you could say his character isn't a like bad like it, it doesn't look goofy like this but at the same time he hasn't really caught much of any type of like, when he first got there and he was feuding with Drew, it, it was looking promising. But then, then it, it kind of faltered off. So, he's kind of stuck in this limbo right now. He's still taken somewhat seriously. You know, I, I think fans still take him as a a, 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 a serious contender or, or a serious threat. But I don't think he's, he's gotten into a, a great feud outside of the Drew McIntyre thing. I think it's kind of falling off like his hype has kind of died a little bit so it'll be interesting to see what they do with him moving forward but it was way better than this this abomination get it off my screen this well join us today as we take a deep dive oh into wasted potential nxt's biggest failed call-ups and if we're going to start somewhere where better to start than with perhaps the biggest missed opportunity from all of the black and gold call-ups over the last few years Alistair black. because when it comes to alistair black Turning him into a huge star should have been easy. Facts. Yes, after having built a nice reputation for himself on the European indie scene throughout the years prior, Tommy End knew exactly how to get himself over. So when he was signed up to an NXT contract in June of 2016, at this point being rechristened Alistair Black, he would have no problem creating excitement everywhere he went. Of course, part of that was due to his gothic Aleister Crowley-inspired character and martial arts-based in-ring style, two elements of his personality which, when combined together, created something truly magic. And with fans immediately getting behind this then, it wouldn't be long before Black was working his way up the ranks of the developmental brand, with him rising so fast here that, by April 7, 2018, he'd have become NXT champion after defeating Andrade Cien Almas at TakeOver New Orleans. Unfortunately, though, despite having all the momentum in the world by the time he was called up to the main roster the following year, things would quickly stall when, upon failing to win the tag team titles with Ricochet at WrestleMania 35, he'd be drafted to SmackDown, where he'd spend the next few months seemingly stuck in a dark room cutting promos on no one in particular. Yeah. That's right, it became apparent at this point that Vince McMahon didn't really know what to do with the Dutch Destroyer, and so, after putting him in a brief mid-card feud with Cesaro, he'd move him over to Raw, where he'd disappear back into his dark room once more, all while his relevance slipped away each and every week. So realizing that he was going to get nowhere under this regime then, uh -huh. Black would make the jump to All Elite Wrestling in July of 2021, there immediately entering into a main event program with Cody Rhodes. 
That said, in the months following this, a back injury and a subsequent hesitation from AEW boss Tony Khan to push him as a singles act would see Black be moved into the trios division alongside Brody King and Buddy Matthews instead. Of course, when it comes to other failed NXT call-ups who ended up jumping ship to AEW, however, well, they'd have a much better time. And here's the thing about this situation. I think even in AEW, I don't think he's really getting the right, uh, I guess you can say, attention he deserves. I think they've kind of dropped the ball with his booking there over, well, over there as well. Um, he, I, I don't know what happened with that one. I, I think it definitely should have worked. But I just don't think they had anything substantial for him, which I'm sure they could have made something for him. Aleister Black could work. People can get behind him. His move, his ring set, in my personal opinion, is fucking crisp as hell. You can get behind him. He delivers some pretty good promos. You know, even if you wanted to turn him heel, that, that could have worked. Put him with someone that the fans like and kind of go with that route. But they just, they really had nothing for them. Like, they just, they they weren't trying to have nothing for him. Let's say that. I'll put that in. But then, given how talented Keith Lee is, this should come as little surprise to anyone. Yes, on the face of it, Lee should have been perfect for Vince McMahon. Fact. After all, he's big, he's athletic, and he can cut a promo in his compelling Fraser Crane cadence. So it seemed like a no-brainer then that, after he was signed up to the black and gold brand in May of 2018, it would be a quick path between there and the main event scene on the main yep. roster for him. And at least initially, things appeared to be going this way as, after spending a year and a half working his way up the ranks, Lee would defeat Roderick Strong to win the North American Championship mm -hmm. on January 22nd, 2020. Then after that, a cameo appearance in the Royal Rumble, which seemed to impress Vince McMahon greatly, would lead him to unifying the North American and world titles down on NXT when he pinned Adam Cole on July 8th of that same year. Yep. But this would end up marking the big man's high point during his time with WWE, as despite things initially looking bright when he was brought up to the main roster full-time not long after this, health issues would see him have to take time yeah, off TV for a while. And when he returned following that, the boss, seemingly having lost interest in his new toy, would try to rebrand him as Bearcat Lee, a pretty awful gimmick that likely would have done more to harm his career <sighs> than to help it if it were not so short. Yeah. Of course, the only reason it was short was because in November of 2021, Lee would be released from the company, with him at this point signing with AEW, where he would become tag team champion alongside Swerve Strickland. That said, while Keith Lee has been able to prove his old boss was wrong about him as a result of his subsequent success elsewhere, he wasn't the first person to see little in a main roster push with WWE and use this as his reasoning for jumping over to Tony Khan's promotion. No, in fact... Um, to count, to add some more to that point, uh, him getting sick, um, and dealing with health issues, that kind of hindered him. And, you know, he's not the, I wouldn't say he's the greatest on promos, um, but he's, he can, he's serviceable and he can, he can work in the ring. You know, I just think honestly, that's what kind of stopped his momentum. Once he got, once he was dealing with health issues, Vince, Vince is one of those people. If, if, if he doesn't see you like, you know, at your peak and then something happens, especially if you're relatively new, there's a good chance. When you come back, he's gonna try to repackage you, and and he'll, you know, he he won't have that same enthusiasm for his brand new toy as we've seen in the past. So I think that just kind of, kind of, uh, really hindered him. And then once they let him go, he went to AEW, and he's found better success in a sense. I still think his NXT run was his greatest run I've seen on television, uh, me personally. But um, you know, definitely the fans, you know, get to see him more. And it's all about really just TV time and TV time being used correctly, not wasting TV time. In fact, way back when that company was first getting started, they'd sign a man who had, during his time up north, gone by the name of Adrian Neville. Oh, and while yeah. he might be better known as Pac today, back much, in 2012, it was Neville who would begin setting the wrestling world on in, fire uh, when, AEW. after signing a developmental contract with NXT at this point, he'd begin putting on stellar performance after stellar performance, all of which eventually led to him becoming that brand's champion in March of the following year. 
Unfortunately, though, despite being the reigning king on the black and gold brand for 287 days after this, when he was called up to the main roster in March of 2015, things would quickly fall apart. Of As course. being only 5'8 in height, he was immediately pigeonholed as a cruiserweight by Vince McMahon, yep. with this pretty much killing his potential of rising anywhere past the mid-card in WWE. That was it. Sure, he would get a lengthy run as the cruiserweight champion between 2016 and 2017, but with that division being considered so secondary by main roster management, it wasn't long before Neville began growing frustrated, uh -huh. with him eventually requesting his release after being asked to lose to backstage heat magnet Enzo Amore. Luckily for him, though, following this, he would get a second lease on life when he became an OG member of the AEW roster, yep. with him here getting to have classic matches against the likes of Kenny Omega, all while becoming an All-Atlantic and Trios champion. Yeah, and it his run in NXT was it, it's still going going on. I, I've, I loved his appearance and his character in NXT. You know, he comes off as a serious, dangerous threat, and I love it. Uh, as soon as he got called to the main roster in WWE and they deemed him as a cruiserweight, it was over. His ceiling was here, and that's it. It wasn't getting past this point right here, so. Was perhaps seeing the success that people like Pac and Keith Lee were having in this company, which convinced yet another failed NXT oh. call-up to sign on the dotted line with Tony Khan herself recently. Of course, had Vince McMahon known how to use her, though, there would have been no need for Ember Moon to do this at all. Facts. Yes, she may not be as big of a star as Becky Lynch or Sasha Banks, but Moon could easily hold her own with either of those women in the ring, something she's been proving since she first got her start way back in 2007. So when she was signed up to an NXT contract in September of 2015, Triple H would immediately set about harnessing her abilities and pushing her to the top of that brand's women's division, mm -hmm. with it not being long before she found herself in a feud with then-women's champion Asuka. And after a couple of failed attempts to get the better of the Empress of Tomorrow, it would be on November 18th of 2017 that the up-and-comer finally got her hands on the title, with her from there going on to defend it against the likes of Shayna Baszler. Yep. Of course, despite all her success on the black and gold brand though, the main roster would be a far different story as, with Vince McMahon's frequently erratic booking, it made it hard for anyone other than a select few to gain a foothold with fans. Back. And this would end up hurting Moon more than most between 2018 and 2020, because with her never seeming to get any sustained storylines to sink her teeth into, she'd end up being returned to NXT in September of 2020, only to then get released altogether the following year. Yep. But while she's since gone on to have more success in AEW as a recent challenger to Jade Cargill's TBS title, another woman whose NXT call-up failed to gain steam has instead returned to her... And the crazy thing is, the crazy thing about this whole situation is she could have been someone that outside of the four horsewomen could have really been someone that they could have elevated in the women's division because they need more women. The four horsewomen they have is cool, it's awesome, but you need more women to really elevate and sink your teeth into you know and i think they could have definitely done that more with her with ember moon i think bro i lo fucking love her fucking finisher shit is fucking great like she has a, a nice in-ring presence and i think people can get behind that it's just i think i don't think she was i uh, uh, not to say she wouldn't give an opportunity but like he said it wasn't substantial fuse they had even she you know came out when, what they was doing with NXT and how it, she was going to rebrand herself and all this other stuff, and then they just didn't do nothing with her. You know, it just kind of sucks in the end. Her old stomping ground of impact. And while this may be a much smaller platform for her, Chelsea Green seems much happier than when she was under the eye of Vince McMahon. Sure, she was never going to be one of the top stars of his women's division, mm -hmm. but given she'd already proven that she could get over with her prior hot mess gimmick in TNA, as well as her brief time in NXT where she'd become a member of the Robert Stone brand, she deserved better than being stuck in lower mid-card hell over on SmackDown when she was drafted there in November of 2020. In fact, so low was her profile here that she would barely ever appear on TV at all. And it's crazy that she's back in WWE now. <laughs> That's the funny thing. She's back in WWE now. <laughs> and while a broken wrist did account for part of this, there's really no excuse for the fact that, throughout pretty much the entirety of what remained of her run, she was completely AWOL, not even getting a chance to prove that she had what it took, with her eventually being released altogether in April of 2021. 
now she's back. Still, though, for as disappointing as this was, at least Green could take solace in the fact that she wasn't the only NXT call-up being wasted at this point, because around about the same time as this was happening, Karrion Cross was crashing and burning in spectacular oh, fashion. Oh, no, not this. And this one was particularly shocking because, even more than Keith Lee, Cross looked like he'd been bred in a lab to be a Vince McMahon guy. Uh, you, what you with his think. size and muscle making him look like a villain ripped straight out of the 80s. On top of that, with the buxom blonde by his side in the form of Scarlet Bordeaux, it seemed like there was no chance he could fail on the main roster, especially as prior to this, he'd had a successful run on NXT, which saw him become that brand's world champion on two separate occasions between 2020 and 2021. Unfortunately, though, once he was called up to the main roster in July of the latter year, he'd quickly find himself struggling when, in his debut match, he'd be booked to lose to Jeff Hardy in no less than five minutes. That makes no then, sense. Then, to make matters worse, as the weeks went on, he'd have everything that got him over taken away from him That's... as he lost his valet, his entrance, and his ring gear in short succession. That... So it really should have come as no surprise then that after botching his debut so massively, Vince McMahon would decide to cut him from his contract not long after. That said, with Vince now gone, Triple H has taken the opportunity to bring Cross back into the fold in recent mm -hmm. weeks, with it currently looking like he's heading for an eventual showdown with Roman Reigns at some point down the line. But not everyone who failed on the main roster then got fired from the company. And it's crazy because, uh, like I was saying at the beginning of the video with him, there was a lot of upside. You just had to keep what you did there on the main roster. Get people accustomed to him. Get people used to his brutal tactics. It would have worked. Now they're doing it now. Granted, um, once again, is he still kind of in this limbo situation? I know you're having this little mini feud with Ray or whatnot. And, and it's, he's doing better, in my opinion, and I think a lot of people's opinion this time around on the main roster than last time uh, initially. But we will see what Triple H has for him in store going forward. I, I I do think he could potentially be a name that, you know, you know, gets his get his stock up as well. Company has had a second chance to return as of yet, because when it comes to someone who Cross recently worked for as part of his control your narrative promotion, EC3 is still waiting for that second chance. Oh man. Of course, EC3 is another one who had the muscular look and verbal skills that should have made him a slam dunk on the main roster of WWE. Didn't work. For some unknown reason though, after he'd built up a name for himself in TNA as both a former world champion and grand champion, then made the jump to NXT where he'd become a top player on that brand's mid card, Ethan Carter III would immediately be buried upon his arrival on Raw buried. in 2019. <laughs> Seriously, this was worse than anything else on this list, as EC3 never even got the opportunity to get over. Now, while some were given bad gimmicks, they were at least given the chance to make these work. With Carter, though, he'd been sent straight down to the comedy 24-7 title division pretty quickly after debuting, meaning that no one would ever take him seriously any time he appeared on screen. Yeah. And with it being visibly evident that he'd stopped caring at this point, it was no surprise that he'd be cut in April of 2020. Bro, he's leaving in the back and catering, bro, <laughs> drinking and eating snacks. He was dead on arrival. That, bro, they, they didn't give... Well, what was the point? You might as well just left him in NXT. Jesus. Him to go it alone and start his own Fight Club inspired promotion, Control Your Narrative, a promotion which hasn't met with much success critically yeah. or commercially. That said, he has a job somewhere right now, the same of which can't currently be said for our next entry, Bo Dallas. Even though some are saying this is Uncle Howdy, who knows, but we'll see how true that is. Yes, Bo Dallas was likely never going to be a main eventer on Raw or SmackDown. But that didn't mean he didn't have something which could have gotten him a nice spot in the upper mid card. As, while he was down in NXT over, between bro. 2012 and 2014, he built a heel character who delusionally saw himself as the brand's top babyface, yeah. someone who could show fans the way forward if they would only believe in him. Bro, it, it was working, bro. <laughs> that it, he was he was this. It was so good because he's the babyface, even though he's not. But he's the baby face that you want to believe in. He's the, the good guy, but he's not really the good guy. He's he's selling the image like he's a great guy, but he's not. I, I love that. That that was a cool character. They, 
they kind of dropped Unfortunately, the ball. Unfortunately, though, once he was called up to SmackDown in May of the latter year, nothing would really be done with this potentially fun gimmick. As with Vince McMahon apparently not seeing anything in it, he'd relegate Dallas to the role of comedy jobber for the most part. Yeah. And while he would occasionally get semi-notable roles on the show, such as when he was part of the Miz Taraj or the Social Outcasts, it always felt like he was a background player in these, yeah. with any potential he had never really being exploited. But while some others are now beginning to realize their own potential under Triple H's new regime, Bo will sadly never get a chance to do this, because after suffering a serious neck injury in oh. January of 2020, he'd be forced to retire from in-ring competition altogether. I didn't know that. Well, I know a lot of people were speculating, like, oh, it's Bo Dallas. Well, he's retired. I didn't even know he was retired. Damn. So I don't know. That's crazy. I, I did not know. Well, I mean, I don't mean he can't he can't still be out there as the character, but I don't know. I did not know he had to retire. Yes, it's sad that we'll never get to see what the Bo Leave gimmick might have been able to do on the main roster had it been given a proper chance. That said, at least he can watch as others find better opportunities in 2022 WWE. And that's especially lucky for the Viking Raiders because when they were first yeah. called up in 2019, it would be quite the experience for them. Oh boy. Of course, they'd already made a name for themselves in both Ring of Honor and New Japan Pro Wrestling in the years prior to this, where they'd gone by the moniker of War Machine. Then, when they signed Bro, with War Machine was fucking tough. I don't care what nobody say. That's that shit works. NXT in 2018, they make an immediate impact upon defeating the Undisputed Era to become that brand's tag team champions. And the fact that their name had been changed to the War Raiders by now didn't even seem like that big of a deal because, while it might not have sounded as cool as War Machine, yeah. it still was a decent enough name for yeah, the team. Yeah, it could work. That said, once they were called up to the main roster in April of the following year, Vince McMahon would decide he didn't really like the sound of the War Raiders. And that was why he would take to naming the team the Viking, the Viking Experience, Experience instead. And something that was so fucking stupid. I, I just, it, that was dumb. Which pretty quickly turned the duo into a laughing stock amongst fans. So bad was it, in fact, that even when they altered their name again to the Viking Raiders, Raiders soon yeah. thereafter, the damage would already be done and uh -huh. no one would take the once feared duo seriously anymore. But then, given the state of WWE's main roster tag team division at that point, it was unlikely they'd have a real chance to get over no matter what they were called. So that's why it's lucky for them that, with Triple H now in charge, he seems much happier to push the duo as a more serious threat again. Yeah. Though how high their ceiling will be remains to be seen. Yeah, they're, 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 they need more people in the tag team division. Uh, they, you know, they're back as these, uh, <laughs> these extreme Viking uh, individuals uh, uh, that are here to send you to Valhalla, you know, and I'm okay with it. I rock with it. They're, I fuck with their their matches, man. I do like their matches. I've always liked their matches, just the names and the gimmicks. War Raiders fucking works. War Machine fucking works. You know what I'm saying? The Viking experience, fucking trash. Just, this this is people don't understand. A name is, is part of the complete package. If you ruin the name, People start to lose interest. That's just what it is. If your name sounds stupid, why the why would I care? Some people say it's just a name. Like the few example, the rare example. Let's talk about Walter. When they changed his name to Gunther, a lot of people weren't happy with it because we just knew they were going to ruin him. Once they changed the name, a lot of times, oh man, they're, they're about to ruin him. And the reports was. He wasn't going to really get, you know, the push that he deserved. But now under Triple H's regime, and even a little bit before Triple H got in uh, complete control, I will say this. Even though I wasn't a big fan of the name change, Gunther, he's made that shit work. He is looking like a very imposing, incredible intercontinental champion, and I love it. I love it. I don't really care for the name as much, but I've gotten used to it, so it works. But initially, when we when we first heard they were changing his name, people got scared because they're like, well, he's dead on arrival because Vince, once he get Vince has to switch something and change something that doesn't really have to be changed sometimes. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, it, it deals with maybe some copyright issues and stuff like that, and I get that. But 
a lot of us were just fearing, oh man, this he's done for. And ultimately that wasn't the case. So I'm it's one of the few times where the name change doesn't really sound as good, but the character development worked and people have gotten used to it. So Whatever happens, though, it certainly can't be any worse than what took place back when another tag team was called up from NXT to the main roster in 2014. Because despite being a fun oh, 80s style throwback act, no, the Ascension yeah. were pretty much dead on arrival. Yeah, they were DOA. Sure, they were never the best tag team in the world, especially not on the black and gold brand where the likes of DIY, American Alpha, and The Revival would regularly be tearing it up by a certain point. Despite this, however, what they had were gimmicks which stood out and which really should have appealed to Vince McMahon, given his liking for cartoon-style characters, that is. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, though, it seems the boss never really took to the duo as, even if they looked like a modern-day incarnation of the Road Warriors, they'd uh -huh. be inexplicably buried pretty hard soon after their main roster there debut we. when, on the January 19th, 2015 episode of Raw, the NWO, the New Age Outlaws, and the APA would all take turns at tearing them to pieces, making it clear that they were no threat to anyone on the roster. Facts. And with this being established in the fans' minds then, it wouldn't be long before Connor and Victor, the two men behind the team, would be reduced to jobber status as yep. they regularly found themselves on the losing end of whatever match they had that week. So by the time they were finally released from their contract in 2019 then, it was almost a mercy for them, as this allowed the duo to return to the indie circuit and try to repair some of the damage which had been done. And as it happens, using the indies to try and repair their reputation is something another team has been forced to do after their uh -huh. main roster call-up in WWE failed so badly. Who's this? Why, it's the Authors of Pain, authors of course. Of, pain, man. of course, the Authors of Pain are another group who really should have succeeded under Vince McMahon's watch, yeah. as with them also looking like something straight out of the Hulkamania era, they appeared to be right up his alley at first glance. And it wasn't as if Triple H wasn't a fan of them either, because during their run on NXT they between 2016 people, and 2018, bro. they'd become tag team champions after defeating DIY at TakeOver San Antonio. On top of that, they'd also gain a huge boost to their credibility when Paul Ellering, yep. former manager of the Road Warriors, started appearing by their side, guiding them on their path of destruction each and every week, just as he had done it for Hawk and Animal years great. before. Unfortunately, though, once the act made it to the main roster in April of 2018, Ellering would be removed after the boss seemingly decided he was too old, with him quickly being replaced by Drake Maverick. Which makes no fucking sense. That, bro, what are, you, what are you talking about? What do you, you give them that little bit of credibility for for the old school fans? Like, oh, okay, they got him with them. It makes sense. Like, uh, I guess. <laughs> At this point. And while Maverick would help the AOP to briefly win the Raw Tag Team titles soon after that, things would soon go downhill from there. As following this, they'd be reduced to the role of lackeys for Seth Rollins, all before being released from their contracts in September of 2020. But at least Akam and Razor can take some solace in the fact that while their main roster run may not have gone as well as they'd hoped, it didn't go as bad as Sanity's did. Because when they were moved up from NXT in 2018, the whole act pretty much fell apart right away. Yeah. Yes, while on the black and gold brand, they'd been a feared stable of heels made up of Eric Young, Killian Dane, Alexander Wolfe, Sawyer Fulton, and Nikki Cross, with Young and Wolfe at one point winning the tag team titles from the Authors of Pain, by the time the group made it to SmackDown, Cross and Fulton would be separated from the pack, yeah. and the three remaining members would be treated like little more than jobbers to the stars. Yep. In fact, so bad would things get that, after being almost completely absent from TV for most of the year following their debut, Sanity would lose to The Miz in a handicap match, making them look like absolute <laughs> failures in the process. So perhaps you know. it was for the best. Were you losing to The Miz in a handicap match? I get it. Miz is a former world champion, Grand Slam champion. That's awesome, but we'll leave that there. Then that they disband completely soon after this, with each of the three members going their own way. As Young went to Raw, Dane returned to NXT, and Wolf moved over to NXT UK. When it comes to our next entry today, however, oh, he'd simply man. refused to give up after his failed start on the main roster. And as a result of this attitude then, he's been able to carve himself a spot out in the mid-card division on Raw in the years since. That said, when it comes to someone as 
glorious as Bobby Roode, Bobby Roode, he really could have been so much more if he was used right. Facts. Hell, he'd already proved this in TNA and NXT, where he became a world champion in both promotions. During his time in the black and gold brand, in fact, he'd go as far as to dethrone the mighty Shinsuke Nakamura, one of the greatest in-ring wrestlers of all time, in order to earn the title. But despite having the look and in-ring style which should have been right up Vince McMahon's alley, yeah. once he joined the SmackDown brand in August of 2017, things would quickly falter for the glorious one, as there, he'd be portrayed as more of a mid-card act, one good enough to win the United States title, but nowhere near the level of real main event stars such as Roman Reigns or AJ Styles. And this would leave him hanging in limbo for a while then, as despite being a very skilled performer, Rude rarely had anything to work with. That said, in the years since, he's been able to fill a role as a bit of a tag team specialist on account of his partnerships with both Chad Gable and Dolph Ziggler. So at least in that sense, he's not been completely wasted like so many others have. I believe have. he's out with injury. But as with everyone else we've mentioned on this list, his legacy in WWE will likely go down as someone who, had he come around just a few years later than he did, would have likely had a much easier transition under Triple H. Yeah. That said, with Vince McMahon being in charge at that point and seemingly having forgotten how to create any stars in his later years, they'll unfortunately forever be remembered as failed call-ups. Yeah, man. Uh, it, 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 it just it sucks because with his gimmick, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a, a Ric Flair ripoff, honestly. But it still could have worked, you know. So his his entrance alone was it it worked. It, it just worked. Like it, people would sing along with it, and I think uh, there were reports that Vince had issues with people singing along with a heels like entrance. But it worked. It when you got the people with your entrance, you're good. You can you know what I'm saying people care when they hear their music. Okay, they get into it and get lively with it. Like it works. They just. Vince just didn't see it, you know. We'll see what happens. I, I, I'm not sure if he is. I think he's still in recovery right now, but we'll see what Triple H has for him coming back from injuries. But some of these uh, on here, man, is just bad timing when they came in. I, I really would have loved to have seen how all these guys, if Triple H was over the main, like over the Monday Night uh, Raw and SmackDown creatively back then, when these guys were hot, oh my gosh, I can only imagine what the division and what the shows would be now. You never know. But comment down below. Let me know. Uh, let me know. Do you guys agree with uh, this list of of individuals? You know, you know, not really getting the the proper push that they deserve. Do you feel like it was more they they were misused by uh, um, creative rather than? just their character themselves how do you feel about that and and what are some other wrestlers you feel like had great potential but was wasted when they got to the main roster let me know down below but i appreciate all the love and support you guys are showing on the channel road to 150k and i'm still the undisputed youtube wrestling champ of the world appreciate y'all kicking with me see y'all next one peace